Here we go again. Of all places in the world, the potential might be very good for, if you count all the countries in Africa. So if you were looking for a place where ge geography might be important, it could have been Africa. But I guess none of you have been to Congo yet. But you know it's a former French Republic. And you know they have a lot of natural resources. And if you have a lot of natural resources and if you're uh, in the central of southern part of Africa, then there are incoming not welcome guests that fight with you over the natural resources. So yes, they have them, but they are not able to utilize them for several reasons. So Africa is probably the area where you would expect this to develop. Okay. Uh, South Africa was independent in 1945 because it was independent in 1911 or something like that. What about the other African nations? How many independent nations were there just after Second World War, 1945? Liberia, because that was given the name the Free State. So Liberia was one. Egypt. Ethiopia, although Italy tried to occupy them, I think that's about it. All the others, they are colonies. So they have the shortest history of all continents, where there are, let us say, a lot of independent nations. But independence is important to develop, no doubt. If you want to develop fast, move to Asia, because NIC countries, Asia, India, and China is Asia. But before you leave, what is the restriction for further growth in China? You will have exactly one hour and 25 minutes to think over and come up with the answer, OK? What will be, let's say, uh, the problem to develop further? in China. Because some of us think that China can grow forever. And the answer is no. Probably it is more or less getting close to what is the limit to grow in China. What do you know about Latin America? If you are a vice president of US, you think they speak Latin down there. Uh, I think it was George Bush who had a vice president. So he in, was invited to Latin America. And I said, no, I'm so sorry. I didn't learn Latin in university. Well, well, you can be a vice president in US without being, let's say, uh, famous, or let's say, uh, used to speaking Latin. But I think it's the last place I would go to speak Latin was in Latin America. I would prefer Spanish if you ask somebody. Okay, but Latin America is the closest area to US where there are developing countries. There are no one else nearer than Latin America. So if you wonder why Krugman is interested in Latin America, it's simply because it's just in a neighbor. Stretch out your hand and you are in Latin America. We normally split it between Central America and Southern America. But I think if you ask Arthur uh, and Guillermo, they would think of it as South and North America. And what is South is South of Mexico, I think. <coughs> A lot of small nations, till you come to the Southern part of it, where you have Brazil, and Argentina, which is quite large areas. And I think one of the longest countries must be Chile, because it stretches from further up there to down south there, and that is almost at the South Pole. At least it is as cold as it is on the South Pole. So it, it, it is, let's say, few countries, 
with a long history, but I think the potential is best in Brazil. So who ranks highest of the three ones? Brazil, <coughs> India, no, uh, China and South Africa. I would drop South Africa. I've been there, it's a very nice country, one of the nicest scenery next to Iceland. Uh, you will see a lot of wild animals in either game reserves or national parks. So if you ask most Norwegian, they have been there for holiday. And they've been to the east more than to the southwest. Because when Norwegian go on holiday, they want to go bathing, swimming in the ocean. Why do they not go to Cape Town, but to Durban? Cape Town is on the west coast, Durban on the east coast. No idea. Okay. Have you heard of the Gold Stream? That's just outside uh, the <coughs> University College door. That makes places hotter. Okay. If you live on the west coast of South Africa, there is also a stream, not a Gulf stream, but a different one. It comes from south. And I think it's the only place on earth where the coast has a desert. That is the neighboring state of South Africa called Namibia. All that you can do is cross to the border of Botswana, because on the coast it's a desert. Why is it a desert on the coast of Namibia or the west coast of Africa? is this cold stream. So if the stream is cold, there is no clouds. If there is no clouds, there are no rains. And if there are no rains, it's a desert. So this is an area where it's quite cold. I've been trying to swim at the beaches of Cape Town. It is sometimes hotter where I live now than it is on the beaches of Cape Town. So if you want to go swimming, go to Durban. Okay, so South Africa has a potential, but not right now. So we dropped South Africa. So we discussed between China and Brazil. Why wouldn't you go to Brazil and China instead? Or no one wants to go to China? Okay. If you are a millionaire living in Shanghai, I would go to China. But most of the Chinese need money. And this, let's say, inequality in distribution of income is probably the biggest problem for China. So if you want to be living in a little bit more unstable political environment, go to China even though there are very good reasons to fear for, let's say, political stability in Brazil, it's even worse than in China. So if you ask me where do you want to go, Brazil, because they have nicer beaches too. <coughs> One of the things we discuss when it comes to development is life expectancy, which simply means when do you think that you end up in a wheelchair and for how many years do you think you will end up in a wheelchair? That has to do with life expectancy. Do you know what a life expectancy is in Norway? And why is it longer for a female compared to a male? If you look around on Saturdays, you will see one of the reasons. You see more of it in Moscow. Because the life expectancy of male in Russia, I think, is about 58. So then I would have been <coughs> dead now if I had been a Russian living in Moscow. So life is expected to last longer in Norway than in Moscow. Okay. What about China? I think they have about the same life expectancy as us. So it's about 78, 79 for male and a little bit more for females, 80, 81. I think so. So that means that people are living longer. That has an advantage and a disadvantage. If you want to know about the disadvantage, read about Russia. 
it means people are not functioning when they are 52, 53. So they're not producing anything else than they had done the first 26 years of their life, so to speak. So they produce less. And the longer you live, the more you can produce and the more you contribute to the economy. Okay? What is the problem if you are a heavy drinker in Moscow and are 57 years old? Is that you get sick, need hospital treatment, home care, assistance, whatever. And is this cheap? And the answer is not at all. So you add to the cost of, let's say, running the society in addition to that you produce less in a shorter period. So yes, life expectancy might help development. But there is no clear link between life expectancy and development. So that was number two. There are no geography, location that gives you, let's say, uh, conditions to develop. There are no simple answer like life expectancy to <coughs> generate development. Okay? Remember that. So when we meet in my wheelchair, I probably uh, rating on the next slide series for this course that is given only on videos because my room is so small that not all the 15 students can attend at the same time. Okay. So yes, you can be. Okay, the problem is low income. If you want to develop, you have to do something with income. Why is it so important to raise income? It raises consumption. Yes. And consumption means more production, and more production means more employment. So if you can raise income, production will increase, more people will be employed. And they move from one sector to another. So if this is China, it looks more or less like China, doesn't it? Here is Mongolia, Ulaanbaatar is up there, okay? Beijing, no, Shanghai is somewhere there, okay? There is a movement from west to east in China compared to the opposite in the US, which has to do with people being employed. If you're living in the western part of China, you are working in or on a farm. Then you are in the agriculture sector. Many of them do not have income, so they survive by what they produce. Are there much trade in that? No. What happens when China starts to grow? Well, simply, they move from the agriculture sector into the producing sector, the industry sectors. Can they move on forever? But very long, since they are about 1.4 billion, aren't they? So for a period, they can move in this direction. But there is an end to it. So at one time, there is no more movement. So there is a limit to growth in China. OK? The other problem is, if you are working on the farm here and try to buy you an apartment here, you need about 345 years of work to afford it. So not all of them can afford to take part in that economy. So that is the other effect. You have to give them money so they can be part of, let's say, the economy that trades and then it can grow. Okay? So if you decide to go to China, stay to the East Coast. Is that a promise? If you come to Norway, stay at the West Coast. If you go to China, on the other side. Okay? <coughs> they need more income. But notice, for those of you who intend to read chapter 22, one day before end of May. You will see that China and India ranks lower than Russia when it comes to income level. Why is that so? Maybe because of oil and gas, which is uh 
sold by Russia? Uh -huh. It's because of population? Yeah, it could be. But I think there is also a time dimension. This is China, down here, their neighbor is India. Independent in, let's say, 1949, at least under the reigning system. Here is 1947. Here is Russia, 1917. So they have a longer political history. And probably that has helped too. So if you ask for a stable political system, they had one. Not stable all the time. Because it took about 72 years. And then what happened? That changed the, <coughs> this letter, Russia as a national state. Soviet Union was falling. Yeah. So the mower went down. Then the Eastern European system collapsed. And what now is Russia? At that time was, and I guess all of you speak Russian, or uh, if you are Beatles, you would say, which means the Union of Soviet Socialistic Republics, CCCP, if you say it in, but it is actually the Union of Social. Soviet Social <coughs> Republic. They were Azerbaijan, they were Turkmenistan, there were Georgia, Ukraine, Belarus, and a lot of states within a system where Russia were the biggest. So it has changed. And do you know who are to blame? I guess. He started the process. But the one that signed uh, probably was also one very fond of drinking whiskies. Chelsea. So he broke down the, uh, the political system. So the change in Russia has been from 1991 on that has changed it. But still, they belong to the upper income uh, economies above China and India. I think numbers of inhabitants might be important. There are more people living in India and China, and less of them involved in, let's say, uh, industries. So that is a problem. OK? So maybe this is the most important difference between them. So the highest ranking of these three are, in fact, Russia. They already produce oil and gas. That's right. I think that much. Note that the upper income classes are Czech, Hungary, and Saudi Arabia. Czech was once two countries. To the east was Czechia. To the west was Slovakia. In the eastern part, the industries developed. In the western part, there were less industries. So if you want one good reason to develop is get yourself industries. Utilize the resources, make products out of it in industries. So that is probably a way to do it. What are they producing in India? Right now, that has made India famous, more or less like Ireland. High-tech production of computer and cars. So yes, they have a high-tech uh, society in India that has helped develop the economy. What about Russia? They had car industries. I'm not sure if they have computer producing industries? No. So they are more or less like Norway. They have natural resources they sell directly to the West. And we call it gas. And you need it. 
at least in Ukraine. But you have to pay for it. Okay, so if you want to develop, get yourself industries. Go pick one or two for a start, but that is important. Hungary, I think during the uh, period till 1989, was one of the highest developed economies in Eastern oh. Europe. Only Poland and Czechoslovakia could compete. But I think uh, in the West, Hungary <coughs> was ranked highest. Okay, so you need industries. Sixty-seven times higher income in what we can call the OECD area compared to the developing countries. Sixty-seven times, which means that they earn about one point four when we earn ten. So for every 10 euro the Germans earn, these developing countries earn 1.4. Do you think they can trade a lot for 1.4? Not if you remember the beginning of this course, which was in January, and we said trade is a minor part of the economy. And the less income, the less trade. So the only way to get out of, let's say, the developing cyclus into a developed economy, you need no more money. Because if you have more money, you trade more, and the more you trade, the more you gain from it. Okay. Even if you are the highest ranking developing areas, future looks slim, doesn't it? One eight. That means if you can go to Iceland once a year, if you are from EU, it takes you eight years if you are from the developing countries, if you can do the same. So all of what you can get access to, it's much slimmer or less. So what do you need to develop? This income so you can trade more if you are Having a financial system working, then you have freer capital movements. If you have money, then you need and can utilize knowledge. And if you have the knowledge, then you can also use the technology. So this is Japan in 1945. Open up for trade start to generate or let's say get access to money, capital movements, develop the knowledge you need to produce and start to produce with higher technology. This sounds like Volkswagen, doesn't it? After the Second World War. So yes, there are four elements to generate development. Trade, money, generate knowledge within the economy and get access to technology. Guess if it was India that came up with the computer science technology in the start? The answer is not. Where did it come from? Silicon Valley. Where did it move to India? It's cheaper. And? The same level or the same quality. And? They have a very high ranking education system. So you can send it to the cheapest place where you can produce it and you're very sure that you get labels that could utilize the technology. So yes, you need the knowledge. Even though it's cheap, it won't help you. If you don't believe me, try to see what happens when we have, I think they call it backsourcing. Have you heard about it? Do you know what it is? Um, when you recognize that your product that you are producing 
like you have before outsourced uh -huh. another country where the labor uh, force is uh, cheaper, uh -huh. but um, yeah, the labor uh, uh, gets more money, so it costs more, and uh, the transport costs are higher. Uh -huh. When you recognize you can do it nearer to your production place with a same level of quality, uh -huh. but uh, not with a high labor um, cost. Okay, so let's say this is a car. We wait with the ship. But okay. We want to produce a car. Now we have outsourced it to China. Why do we backsource it? It's simply because of Do you know what a robot is? Do you have to pay wages to that? Will it work only eight hours? So all these gives you lower cost because instead of having Chinese workers working for eight hours, they can take him home and do it with a robot and they can produce it all 24 hours if they want to. Cost nothing. If it's French, they don't go on strike. So it is, in fact, better because you get better quality at the same price and then you backsource it. Okay. The Norwegians, what kind of ship producing companies do you know nearby that has backsourced the hull production? We have to learn you a little bit more then. Have you heard the name? Do you know where it is? They backsource from Romania to Ulstanvik, which is just around the corner down here, because they can robotize it. What do you need when you have to produce a ship is very high quality. Instead of letting manual workers produce a hull, let a robot do it. Precise, there is no glip between, let's say, two plates of the, <laughs> the ship. It won't leak like it did in South Korea or something like that. So it's safer, cheaper, and better quality. So they back source. So therefore, yes, there might be a solution to offer cheap labor, but not for too long. So then you have to come up with your own industry. But the reason why they went to India was low wage, a lot of labor accessible, but they were also well educated. So they could, in fact, produce computer as they needed. If you split it between those earning income, there are varieties. So there is not a single picture showing that wage per worker is a sign of uh, development. In fact, they can develop with very different wage levels. But they need more people getting. OK, let's have a quick look at what is a developing country looking like. Number one, historical extensive direct government control. That sounds like Soviet Union, China, at least. So China is obviously number one. Why is it a direct government control? It's simply because it's operated by the party, the Communist Party, which has what, less than a tenth of a per percent, I think, of the members will be members, okay? Long in history of high inflation is not Italy, but could be Argentina. Uh, we credit institution is obviously Argentina. Uh, managed exchange rate is obviously China. 
because China is, uh, has a, an exchange rate that is decided by the government. Why do they want to keep the exchange rate on a certain level? So that others can buy their products. So they keep the prices down. So they simply do it as a trade policy instrument. Is it fair? Not if you ask US. Is it fair if you ask the Chinese? Well, I think they are happy with it so far. So yes. This sounds like Norway, doesn't it? Trade is dominated by natural resources. What do we sell in Norway? Give me the two highest ranking. Fish. To me, that sounds like natural resources. What about you? Yeah. Okay. Farming. OK. Oil and gas. I would say indication of natural resources, aren't it? Yeah. So yes, it could be Norway. It isn't. So very often, they do not utilize the natural resources to develop industries. So the problem, I think, is five and six. Corruption. Major problem. Simply means that money just evaporates in the economy. So instead of being, let's say, available for use, they are somewhere in the bank, in the tax evasion paradise, let's say, on Ca Cayman Islands. I'm not sure if Seychelles is, but it's a nice place to swim at least. Yeah. So yes, money leaks out of the economy by corruption. If you don't tell them watching us on video, I think one of the major problems for Russia is, and the richest person probably in this world is their president. So yes, it is a problem. I don't think that is the reason why Yeltsin was drinking so much whiskey and invited all the male in Moscow into his parties. So I don't think it has to do, let's say, with uh, the way of life. But corruption is obviously one of the biggest problems if you want to develop. Do you know when the Great Depression was? That was not when you got your grades after the first exam, was it? <laughs> no. So it was at a different time. What was the Great Depression? 19? started in 1929 with the collapse on Wall Street. And then it took about 80 years, so to speak. Then came not a Great Depression, but the Great Recession. If you read Krugman, they do not call this period we are now into for the Great Depression, although it looks like one, but they call it the Great Recession. What is the difference between depression and recession? is that you have to know macroeconomics. And no one admits that they know something about macroeconomics here. Okay. What is a depression is simply the economy is shrinking. What is a recession is simply that the growth rate is diminishing, but it still can grow. So the difference was in the 30s, the economy shrank. Now it's kept almost at the same level, but no doubt not a very good period to be a Spanish uh, or a Spanish worker seeking labor or seeking work or employment somewhere in Spain. And then you would say it's worse in Greece. Yes, it is. But still, it's not a depression. Okay. The problem for Argentina was not public debt, but also private. And since public and private debt were linked together, the only one that could, let's say, guarantee for the loans was the state of the private person, because they had gone bankrupt. They didn't have the money, but the state could have the money. So one of the problems with defaults is private defaults also counts uh, or the nation also counts for the private, not only the public. 
So that's the problem. Okay? You know when the World War II ended? And the World Bank and the AMF were introduced in Bretton Woods, the first one. Why wasn't the World Bank introduced in 1944, but in 1945? Demands your knowledge in history to be better than it is right now. Okay. When did they sign the treaty for the United Nations? They did it in San Francisco in 1945, a year later than Bretton Woods. And none of you know who was the first General Secretary of United Nations. He was not German, he was not French, but the head of AMF now is a female from France. But this was a male. He was not from Southern Europe, but he was from Northern Europe. And now we are getting closer and closer to the place you are now staying at. And that is in Norway. He was a Norwegian Foreign Minister, Minister of Foreign Affairs, Trygve Lee. The second general secretary was a Swede. He died in Africa. Some things, this plane was shot down over Congo. So if you wonder if Congo has been a silent place for the last 15 years, it started right now. The answer is not. It was already a problem when they got their independence in the 40s, no, no, in the 60s. 56, I think, is the first African state getting their independence. I guess it might have been Kenya, 1956. But gradually, almost everyone got their independence, with a few exceptions. On the north coast of Africa, being a colony of, and the state was, Tunisia. and Algeria. Algeria. So there was an independent war in Algeria, I think, not in the other countries. No, so Algeria was one of the latest. They got their independence because the president said they won't get an independence as long as I am president. Now I'm a president, they got independence, and they call him General de Gaulle. So that was the start. Of it. But United Nations was established in 1945, and then you got the World Bank, which is part of the United Nations system. The idea of AMF and World Bank was to guarantee money for states that needed money to generate development. What are the alternative inflows of financial, should we call it values, is by banking, official lending, and if I ask the Norwegian what is the Norwegian aid agency for development. You have one in the US. This is what we call official lending. They provide money for developing countries because they need it and it's part of official lending. So that is official lending. What is the difference between official lending and direct foreign direct investment? That's private. That's private. So if a French company invests in an African company, that is foreign direct investment. Official lending is if the Norwegian government, through its aid agency, delivers money to the same country. <coughs> Which of them are best? You will tell me when we meet in 10 years from now on, okay? Since then one of you are head of a German company investing in Angola when it's no longer too corrupt. Okay? Yeah. Firm ownership is when American computer companies invest into India and that is what we can call then 
portfolio investment. You invest in different countries to have, let's say, risk uh, uh, governance. So that is a way to govern risk. If I lose money in US, I have a company in India that would at least give me a profit. So these are the one, two, three, four, five elements of getting access to money you need for development. Public, private, or private firms uh, investing into your economy. Okay. I guess all of you know what debt is. At least when you finish your studies and your debt is 300 euros or at least 50. More. More, okay. Yeah? <laughs> so that is debt. Then you know what that is. What is equity finance? And why are the two last equity finance? Have you at any time heard about what equity might be? Somebody shared the secret with you and tell you what is equity? Never. It's okay. money from the markets? Yeah. That is from the bank. Uh, or even more precise, money from the firms. Because the firm has equities. It simply means it has uh, values that they own that they can use for production. So that is an equity. Uh, so, but also in the market, that's correct, yeah. But normally we think of this as a firm's investment, that is equity. Well, if it's a bank, public or private, then it is a debt. So it's, uh, the idea is to pay back. What about equity? Why do firms put money into, let's say, Congo as an equity? What do they expect to get in return? This is business administration. May God forbid it. Okay. What do they expect when they let you have the money in what we call equity finance? A higher rate of return. Yeah. So more profit, or at least profit, is the way you pay back for the equity. So you invest into, let's say, production that gives you extra profit. So that is profit. So the difference between debt and equity is profit and interest. So if it's interest, because you have a debt, you have to pay it to the bank. If it is an equity finance, it's simply paying profit back to the firm that invests into it. Okay? So the difference is, Profit or interest. So when we meet after 10 years, and I try to tell you that I live by my profits, you will look and say, you don't mean by your interest. And the answer is, of course, yes. So equity simply means I've invested into something that produced something, and I get a profit out of the business. Equity is then a value that is used for production. Debt simply means that there is an institution lending your money, not involved in the production. You can use it for whatever purposes, as long as you pay back by interest every year. <coughs> there is an original sin. That sounds like a Bible, doesn't it? That is when Eve asked Adam, do you want an apple? And then you say, no, I already invested into the company. I didn't need not more of it, OK? Uh, so the original sin problem is not important for us. And that means you can answer and say, drop reading original sin, OK? To get the economy moving, you need credit or capital or money. So therefore, if you want to develop, get yourself financial institutions. And then you can look at me and say, what was clue number three? 
And that is, there is no simple answer that the lending or equity investments generate more development. But probably you are linked to a market with equity funding, which simply means it's owned by a French company. They need to sell the products. Guess where they are selling them? Since they are French, at least in France. So as long as France is a moving economy, growing, this will help you also develop. When it comes to lending, it's more uncertain. But there are no, uh, let's say, given pattern of funding that generates development. It varies. OK. Have you been to East Timor? Never. Do you know what East Timor is known for? It's a divided island. It was once a colony on the reign of Indonesia. But the reason why it is known is that it's the second out of two countries in Asia that is a Catholic country. But it's a small, has been a war there, they try to develop, they are out of the news uh, right now, but that is an area where there might be development. But I don't think religion helps generate development. Although somebody claims that, I think it was Dutch religion, that generated, uh, let's say, the business strategy in Europe. So being a sound Christian, you can operate businesses with big profits. But I don't think that helps East Timor. Okay? So know there are no signs of, of the way you fund uh, development that can generate, let's say, easily more development. So then there is only one left. We need 11 minutes break, 14 16, sounds okay, no objection, okay. Of, and for those objecting, they will have a fish dinner next Wednesday. Fresh air, 